technically everyone in El Salvador is kind of walking on graves. Todas partes pasan por aquí, por México. Van de niños, adolescentes, adultos mayores, me ha tocado ver. ¿Por qué me vine a Honduras? Por necesidad, por darle una vida mejor a mis hijos. All the violence, the starving, really we don't want to suffer anymore, and so we are immigrating. Han resultado prácticamente cuatro delincuentes terroristas fallecidos. Todos pertenecen a la pandilla MS. Hemos encontrado una UCI, eh, dos pistolas y un revólver. <risa> We found ourselves in a place where uh, we had to decide to die or to leave. I decided to leave. No issues have stirred more passion and heat on the campaign trail than immigration and border security. When Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists, and some, I assume, are good people. But I speak... Trump's remarks sparked widespread outrage, but here's something that got lost in the firestorm. The biggest apprehension figures on our southern border these days don't involve Mexicans. Their numbers have been dropping big time. The largest increases have been coming from somewhere else, and that biggest somewhere else is Central America, particularly the Northern Triangle. Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. Mexico is just their stepping stone, and Texas is the first stop for almost 90% of them. In the spring of 2016, the Texas Tribune went to southern Mexico and to the violent epicenter of the Northern Triangle, El Salvador, to see who's coming across our border and why. Once they leave Central America, getting through Mexico brings its own challenges. Al otro lado del río, pues ahí nos asaltaron, nos quitaron todo nuestro lo que traíamos, 2,143 pesos. Pues no nos dejaron nada. Gracias a Dios que no hicieron nada ni a mi esposa ni a mi niño. Uno con, cargaba una pistola y el otro con, con un machete. Y les quitaron todo su dinero, todo, los celulares. Yo revisaron todo, me gustó también. A mí me sería, me revisaron. Me tocó levantarme la blusa. The people we encountered were fleeing the twin evils of crushing poverty and staggering crime rates. That's particularly true in El Salvador, where warring street gangs gave the country the dubious title of murder capital of the world in 2015. Many of the victims end up here in San Salvador's central morgue. Fresh bodies from the streets go to the Department of Pathology. The ones that are badly decomposed or dumped in mass graves or in need of DNA analysis those remains come here to the Department of Forensic Anthropology. They try to find out what happened to the victims. We have seen a lot of decapitations, a lot of the dismemberments. They have had multiple wounds all over their body. And so where it's not just a quick cutting off the head, sometimes they are stabbed a lot of times. Uh, they, they're hacking off their limbs. So it's a little bit of a slower death. There's a room where remains go when no one has come forward to claim them. Here, boxes of decades-old bones from El Mozote, site of the worst massacre in El Salvador Civil War, sit on the shelves next to more recent victims of the gang wars. Forensic anthropologist Saul Quijada says it's almost like the Salvadoran Civil War, officially over as of 1992, never really ended. It was a culture of violence eh, that found a warm place in something social y en algo cultural también. Pues la sociedad salvadoreña eh, ha aprendido a resolver las, los conflictos de forma violenta. This is one of the gang war's youngest victims, still waiting to be claimed. Another victim, this one a teenager, was the relative of a government prosecutor. He was apparently murdered in retaliation by the 18th Street gang. They believe he was hacked to death with a machete. The machete go went this way. So, so they cut the head yeah. off or what? No, completely, but they did try. 
those same brutal tactics have been used by Salvadoran gang members based in the U.S., and authorities say some of them have crossed our border along the same routes as migrants fleeing their crime-ridden homeland. Here in El Salvador, the authorities have been trying all sorts of strategies to stop the violence that is causing so many to seek refuge in the U.S. Merciless crackdowns, a heavily criticized and short-lived truce between the gangs and the government. Now they've sent out a thousand police and army soldiers into the worst areas to quell the violence. Efectivamente, vivimos una una situación donde la violencia y la delincuencia han alcanzado eh, niveles importantes, pero que no se dio de un día para otro. Esto fue un proceso que muchos incluso nunca visualizaron que esto pudiera llegar a estos niveles. It's not going to be solved quickly. While we were talking to Chief Cotto, he got an urgent call and had to briefly stop our interview. It was yet another report of MS-13 gang members getting shot by police amid El Salvador's ongoing crackdown. It was in Ayagualo, about 20 minutes south of the capital. A warning here, some of the images you were about to see are disturbing. The four suspected gang members killed here brought the number of violent homicides in El Salvador to at least 18 in a single day. That's not an unusual occurrence. You can see why people are leaving El Salvador in droves to escape all of this. Getting out of Central America into Mexico is deceptively easy. If you think we have a porous border in Texas, and we do, take a look at the southern Mexican state of Chiapas, at the spot where the Suchiate River divides Mexico and Guatemala. It's wide open for business down here. All kinds of goods and all kinds of people are crossing here in plain sight of the official entry point. Many are tourists and day laborers. Some are migrants. Nobody stops them. Marvin Danilo and Esfin Lopez are balseros. They take people and goods back and forth on rafts called balsas here. La mayoría van rumbo a Tijuana, Texas. We met Eric Alexander Reyes on the Mexican side of the river right after he waded over from Guatemala. He said gangs have made his native El Salvador a living hell. Like most who cross here, Reyes was headed to Tapachula, about 30 miles away. While there's no real security on the border itself, there is a lot of it on the roads heading north. There are checkpoints on all the main roads leading away from the Guatemalan border. Hiring a smuggler is the safest and surest way to get through all of that. Otherwise, rodeándola, voy rodeando las casetas todo. No me meto mucho ves porque si te metes mucho hacia el monte están los ladrones. Once they get to Tapachula, a lot of them end up here. See, uh, this is the albergue called Belén. Uh -huh. This is a casa de inmigrantes. Over here we have a, a place to stay for three days. I could be able to be clean over here, you know, uh -huh. to wash my clothes and to have something to eat and water, mm -hmm. which is the uh, most important. In 2014, Mexican authorities launched a program called the Southern Border Plan to crack down on Central American migrants traveling toward the United States. That stopped most of the migrants from taking the train known as La Bestia, the Beast, but it didn't stop them from coming. Without the train, the migrants end up walking for miles and miles, enduring abuse, shakedowns, and robbery. To accommodate all the diverted foot traffic, a new shelter was established in the tiny town of Chahuites. Since Mexico launched its southern border plan, the shelter director, a Central American migrant himself, says he's been deluged with worn out travelers, many of them whole families or children traveling alone. Que se implementó este programa, pues ya los compañeros ya buscaron otras rutas alternas. 
más peligrosas es así, más agotada, que hay compañeros que llegan con los pies destrozados, porque caminar desde Tapachula hasta aquí, bastante, caminan a veces hasta más de una semana. Estamos recibiendo, imagínate, 120 personas diarias, que diario se van, diario llegan. One of the last stops in Mexico's deep south is Ixtepec, Oaxaca, a launching pad for migrants heading toward the United States. Alberto Donis runs the shelter here. He says the crackdown by Mexican authorities has done nothing but increase the misery of the migrants. Y desde que entra el programa La Frontera Sur, pues ya todo el mundo llega asaltado. Todo el mundo, todo el mundo. Si ustedes preguntan a la gente, pues todos te van a comentar que fueron asaltados en toda la ruta para acá. This man says he was robbed twice, including by federal police that are supposed to be protecting migrants from abuse. Vieron el dinero y nos dijeron que si no les dábamos el dinero, que nos iban a entregar a migración. Entonces que nosotros decidíamos que si entregábamos el dinero o nos deportaban. But the people still come. Eh, el mayor de, el deseo de cada uno de nosotros que miramos hasta estos lugares es para que nuestra familia tenga un mejor porvenir. Recordando algo, si yo sufrí, hambres, necesidades de que anduve descalzo, necesidades que tuve que pedir un, una camisa, un pantalón para ponérmelo. Mi mayor anhelo es que mis hijos no crucen esta situación. Not all of them will reach the U.S., at least not on their first try. But even when they end up getting stopped in Mexico and sent back home to deportation processing centers like this one in San Salvador, it's just another obstacle to overcome on the long road north. I am an immigrant and I ask for forgiveness to the American town and the Mexican pueblo. It's not our fault. Things made us leave the country. Really, that's the truth.